All right, good morning and welcome to Calvary Community Church, the Sunday morning Bible study. This hour before the uh, before the, the message from the pastor, happy St. Valentine's Day, and happy as le- unless you've forgotten it and then you're in trouble, but then you knew that already probably. All right, thank you, Carl. We uh, have been looking at a few practical items from Dale Carnegie, and Dale Carnegie... I just looked at it and I've already forgotten that the seventh thing that Dale Carnegie would remind us of is, it's right here in front of my eyes, be a good listener. Be a good listener. People like that when you do that. Don't, as you're in conversation with somebody, be thinking about what you're going to say next. (laughs) That is, just make sure you're hearing the other person talk and, and not planning your rebuttal when you're in conversation, people will like that. People will be encouraged by that. And we want to encourage one another in the church. We're going to turn today again to Luke chapter 20. We read these, the first two verses where we're starting. We, we sort of covered last week, Luke chapter 20, verse 19 and 20. We'll start with that. Jesus is in the temple. He's teaching. It's a place of prayer. It's not supposed to be a place of money changing. He's cleansed the temple just before this. And the authorities have, last week we talked about his challenge. They challenged his authority. What, by what authority do you do these things? The verses from last week say, and he said, let me just ask you one question. I had somebody remind me the other day that when you, if you ask a person of Jewish descent, why do Jewish people always answer a question with a question? The person of Jewish descent said, why not? (laughs) And Jesus said, I will also ask you a question. He was Jewish, of course, and said, what about that authority of John the Baptist? Was that from heaven or of men? And they thought about, oh my, oh my, oh my, John the Baptist. Everybody loved John the Baptist. But he said Jesus was the Messiah. So I said, we're not going to tell you the answer to your question. He said, well, then I won't tell you the answer to your question. Could he? Yes, he could. Did he? No. No, he left it that way. When verse 19 and 20, we'll just read these two verses quickly again from last week. I'm looking for the mouse. There it is. The chief priests... And the scribes, those would mostly be Pharisees, though there'd be some Sadducees among them, the same hour sought to lay hands on him. That does not mean they wanted to ordain him into the gospel ministry. This is not that kind of laying on of hands. This is how a police officer, an officer of the law, would take a hold of someone to restrain him, to put him under arrest. They sought to arrest him. They feared the people. They perceived he had spoken this parable against him. After he answered or didn't answer their question about authority, he talked about the man that would miserably destroy the ones that wouldn't have their rulers to reign, their ruler to reign over him. Verse 20 says, They watched him and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men that they might take hold of his words so that they might deliver him under the power and the authority of the governor. Why don't we pray and then we'll get into this. Father in heaven, as we look in your word this morning, we, we need your help. We need to have help in understanding and then in remembering what we have understood and let it percolate down like the water in a percolator to through the through the coffee grounds to pick up all the richness of what's in there so that we can enjoy it afterwards and remember it. And, and then in this case of your word, Father, help us to know and understand and remember and then do what your word would have us do. Teach us your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. They sent spies. Are these good folks? They feigned themselves just men. I would take that to mean that they weren't really just men. They were faking it. (laughs) And they wanted to take hold of his words. They're looking in the teaching for something that he's saying that they can use to accuse him, and not just accuse him before the Jewish authorities, but to accuse him 
before Pontius Pilate, the governor. They, when they say they want to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor, they're looking to get him killed. They want him executed. <coughs> it wasn't just, let's throw him out of the synagogue. They want him gone, and the Jewish rulers had lost to Rome the authority to execute criminals. They still occasionally got wild and, and would spontaneously stone somebody, but in Jerusalem, surrounded by the authority of Rome, the provincial capital, so to speak, or the garrison of many soldiers, if they wanted Jesus gone, they'd have to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor Pontius Pilate. And so they're looking for something not just against what they consider the, the, the law of Israel, but something against the law of Rome. So they're looking at his words, and later you know the accusation is that he, he taught sedition. He said he was a king, and they're looking for that. And so this group, spies from the, from the leaders of the temple, the Sanhedrin, they asked him, saying... Master, we know thou sayest rightly, neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teachest the way of God in truth. What, is it, what do you call that? We know these people's character is that they're not just men. Said so in the verse just before this. They feigned themselves to be just men. So how should we understand these words that they say? You teach, you say, and teach right. And you don't accept thou the person, neither acceptest thou the person of any. You're not prejudiced. You're not uh, someone who prejudges, but you teach the way of God truly. I don't think they believed any of that. They're trying to catch him. So we call this flattery, right? This is a political speech, if you will. <laughs> They're going to say what they need to say to, to get him to, to say something that they can catch him in. And their question is a tricky question. Is it lawful for us, Jewish people, to give tribute unto Caesar or no? Why is that a tricky question? Well, Jesus saw that it was a tricky question. He perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Why are you trying to trick me? Did you think he knew? I think he knew. When he asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know. He's giving them an opportunity, but they don't take it. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or no? If he says, oh, no, no, Jewish people don't do that, there, there's something against Rome, isn't there? If he says, well, of course you pay tribute to Caesar, then, then that's contrary to the Jewish perception of what their obligation was. And his answer is, show me a penny. Show me a coin. Let me have one of your, give me a dime. Give me a nickel. Give me a penny. Whose picture Whose scripture, whose superscription hath it? I don't even know if I have a coin, but I might. Okay, whose whose image is going to be on Bob's coin when he gets it out? You going to care to hazard a guess? Oh, there it is. That looks like Abraham Lincoln. Eh? Render unto Lincoln the things that be Lincoln's, and unto God the things that be God's. So. Lincoln goes back in Caesar's coin purse. I can pay taxes with it. Belongs to Caesar, the government. Render unto God the things which be God's. And we usually go right past this because it's such a wonderful answer. It shut their mouths right away. They could not take hold of his words before the people. But after I had kind of prepared this lesson, they marveled at his answer and held their peace. They just that calmed them right down. Um, it occurs to me that there's a really practical lesson in Jesus' answer in verse 25. Render unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's. He specifically had in mind money, right? And he didn't say, keep it to yourself. He said, give what belongs to Caesar to Caesar. If, if the government says you owe some taxes, pay the taxes. I owe taxes. I, I, I've had a successful year. I get to send the government a significant check in April because I didn't let them keep any, of, any more of my money than I did all the year long. They don't pay interest on it. 
They don't reward you for paying ahead. When, if you get a large refund check when you file your income taxes, you have made an interest-free loan to the government and they're giving it back to you without interest and you feel grateful because they gave you money, right? It was your money. It was your money. So I have an attitude about that and I'm glad I'm, glad I'm able to pay my taxes, but I'm glad I'm paying them when I'm paying them. And that's just the way I think about that. <laughs> but anyway, but the money is, is Caesar's. Well, what about the things that, that should be God's? Are, does anything come to mind about what belongs to God? I have a hint. I want to look at a bookmark over here, number two. Proverbs 19, verse 27, the father to his son says, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. The father to his son says, Stop listening to wrong teaching, wrong instruction. It causes you to err from God's word, the Bible. Stop listening to false teaching. But it's a father to a son. Um, what are you getting at, Mr. Gilbert? I think the Bible thinks, I think the Bible surely teaches that the children belong not to Caesar, but to God. And parents are instructed to guard the education of their children. I would look at another passage, a different generation entirely, Jeremiah chapter 10, thus saith the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of the heathen, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Don't learn the way of the world around you. If you are God's people, Verse 1 says, Hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Now, that, we're not the house of Israel, but we are God's people, the church. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. I'm sure of this, and yet ashamed at the same time for a reason that you'll understand in a minute. I taught in Christian schools for a good number of years, and I thought it was appropriate because those parents were trying to educate their children correctly under the influence of the Word of God. And so they allowed us, the teachers in the Christian school, to by, be their proxies in the education of their children in the ways of the Lord. I taught math and science and history. My wife taught English and history. And they learned the Bible in all of those subjects because it's through and through and through. A good Christian school integrates God's truth and God's Word with every subject. I raised three children myself. They went to Christian schools as long as I had influence in their lives. My youngest child has finished a teaching degree through the university system and is a public school teacher in, in the Panhandle, Florida. And I'm kind of proud that she chose teaching, and I'm kind of ashamed just a little bit because of my influence on her seems to have diminished. She's teaching middle school science in a public school, and I don't think her curriculum allows her to guard against the way of the heathen. And it just bothers, I, I wish I could help her. We, we send her magazines and things to try to influence her, but we can't overcome a university education, so that is what it is. What is the positive side of this? Back in the book of Deuteronomy, Jay, if he were here, would rec recognize this verse, the very popular verse that Israel used to identify themselves, what they recite each time. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Shema Israel, Elohim, Adonai, Echad, Elohim. Uh, I might have got that wrong, I don't know. They substitute Adonai for what we call Jehovah or Yahweh, and the God is Elohim. Adonai, Elohim, Echad, Adonai. Yeah, I got that. That's closer. Don't judge me on my Hebrew pronunciation. But look what it says right after that verse. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's good stuff. And these words which I command thee shall be in thine heart. Memorize this stuff. And, verse 7, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
There's a commission there for parents. This is your job. First you get God's word into your mind and heart. You memorize it. You learn it. And then you teach it. And don't just teach it. Teach them diligently. Well, what do you mean when you sit down in your house? When you walk down the road? When you go to bed at night? When you get up in the morning? There it looks like four different occasions, which is basically all the time, that you continue to put in front of your children God's word. Teach them diligently. That's the positive side of learn not the way of the heathen. Cease, my son. Cease, my son. To hear the instruction that causes to err from the words of knowledge. Well, that just came into my mind when we were talking about what Jesus said when he said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's, verse 25 of Luke chapter 20. The folks listening to him could not take hold of his words. That was what they wanted to do. They wanted to take hold of his words. You remember that right up here, don't you? They wanted to take hold of his words, verse 20 said, and they could not. They could not take hold of his words before the people. They asked him a trick question, and he answered it in a way that they could not capture him. They marveled at his answer and held their peace. In another passage, the Jewish leaders send soldiers to arrest Jesus, and instead of arresting him, they go and listen to him, and they come back empty-handed to the Jewish leaders, and they said, where's Jesus? And they said, never man spake like this man. You got to listen to him, you understand. Well, that was Pharisees. That was their party. And Verse 27, he's still in the temple. He'd still like to be teaching. And another group of the leaders from the Sanhedrin comes to him. Verse 27, there came to him certain of the Sadducees. Certain of the Sadducees, which deny there's any resurrection. They deny basically all the supernatural. I, I don't have a, yes, I do, a bookmark for this. Who's the Sadducees? Oops. What did I do? Number it wrong? Possibly. I may have just plain messed it up. Okay, we're going to go without a bookmark to Acts 23, verse 8, because it was supposed to be a bookmark and it wasn't in my list. Okay. The Sadducees, this is who Paul is talking in front of, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, Luke tells us the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, there's no angel, there's no spirit. They're liberals. They're deniers of the supernatural. They're the people that take the Bible and cut out all the miracles and say, what a wonderful teacher of morality was Jesus. No, the Sadducees, it's easy to remember the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were self-righteous. They would say, I'm fair, I see. The Sadducees didn't believe in anything at all, and they said, I'm sad, you see. Yeah, so. The Sadducees came and asked Jesus a question, and they deny the resurrection. They asked him, and saying, and this question contains, in a sense, a lie, because they tell a story after they refer to the Old Testament saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if any man's brother die, and he's got a wife, and if he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now that is in, in Moses, that's in the Bible. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 25. We don't need to look at it. It basically says just that. And then they tell this story, starting in verse 29, and they use words that I call a lie. There were, therefore, seven brothers... And I just don't think this is likely true. The first took a wife and died without children. That part could be true. And the second took her to wife, and he died childless. So far, it's not too much of a stretch. And the third took her. And in like manner, the seven also, all seven in turn, married the woman and died, having no children. And they left no children and died. In verse 32, last of all, the, children, the woman died also. What's wrong with this story? What's wrong with those brothers? 
why would you continue marrying a woman who's um, apparently been killing off your brothers? I don't know. And then she died also, and they got no children. And the question of the Sadducees is not, isn't that a silly story? It's, therefore, in the resurrection, ha, 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 whose wife of them is she? Seven had her to wife. Now, the Pharisees, standing around listening, said, oh, they asked him that question. We hate it when they ask us that question because we don't know how to answer that question. They use that same stock story to put the Pharisees down. Every time they hear the Pharisees teaching about resurrection, they raise this thing up about seven brothers and one wife and whose wife she going to be. But Jesus answers them. Jesus answering said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection." He compares this world, which we're familiar with, with that world, the resurrection world, the resurrection from the dead. I would make just a, a brief note here that Matthew records the same answer, and he throws in something that Luke didn't include. Jesus answered, said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And then he gives the rest of the answer as Luke gave it. They're not marrying or given in marriage. But it's interesting that he said, you are making a mistake and you don't know God's word and you don't know God's power. And he contrasts this world which with, with which they and we are familiar to that world, the world, the world to come. And Jesus says there, there's no marriage, there's no death. And in some real sense, we're, people in that world are equal unto the angels, which is to say they don't die. There's no old sickly angels who pass away. Angels are just spirit beings. They just go on. They are eternally existent. Some of them are fallen and punished eternally, and some of them are blessing to us and God eternally. That world, now he uses this expression, they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. And unless I messed my bookmarks up, I think this will help us understand. What is Jesus talking about? Obtain that world by being worthy of it. And this is from Acts chapter 13, where Paul has preached in the synagogue, Acts chapter 13, and he's given the gospel, and the next week came along, and the whole city, which is a whole lot of Gentiles as well as the Jewish people, came together to hear the word of God, and the Jews that had heard him a week earlier saw this crowd of uh, Gentiles, that's us guys, they were filled with envy, Oh, it's so wonderful. All the Gentiles have come to our service. No, that's not what they said. They said, I can't find my parking place. I can't get a seat. It's too crowded. There's no social distancing going on. They were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Let me just for a second back you up. What was it Paul was saying here in verse 38 and 39? Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, the one that God raised up, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. What's that? Sounds a little bit like the gospel message, isn't it? Forgiveness of sins, and the only requirement, all that believe, and believing they are justified, they're declared righteous, you couldn't get justified by trying to do the good works of the law of Moses. It's a forgiveness message. It's preached and believed, and that's the end of it. 
And then there's a warning in verses 40 and 41. Look out, you despisers. You turn this away, you'll perish. I work a work in your days, and you won't believe even if it's declared unto you. And then they went out, and a week later they came back together. The Gentiles said, Why don't you, would you mind preaching to us next week? And many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, and they taught them between Sabbath and Sabbath, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. It was a good meeting. It was a meeting where people got saved, and, and Paul continued to teach them. And the next Sabbath day, everybody comes together, and the Jews say, this is our place. You're sitting in my seat. You're parked in my spot, and the restaurant's going to be too crowded when we dismiss. They just didn't like it, and, and it's the truth. They really didn't like it, and not so much. They contradicted his message, and they blasphemed, which would be, in my mind, saying Jesus is just an old, illegitimate sinner. That's blasphemy. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, bolder than before, <laughs> He said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, Jews, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. The Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light for the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the, world, of the earth. And the Gentiles heard it. They were glad, 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 glad. I highlighted the word unworthy there because that fit in with the passage we were looking at before in Luke chapter 20. Those that are accounted worthy of that world, the world to come, the world of the resurrection. Now, you don't get worthy of it by living a right life. They that shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. How do you get there? Jesus was asked to raise Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. And one of Lazarus' sisters said, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus says, he'll rise again. She says, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection of the last day. But even now, if you ask him, your father will do whatever you ask him, won't he? Huh? Huh? And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoso liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she said, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God that should come into the world. She was worthy of the resurrection because she believed in the one who made the way to resurrect. Now, in verse 37, he's not quite done with his answer. He's answered their question foolish people. You don't know the Bible. You don't know the power of God. But he goes on and says, you know, Sadducees, you question the resurrection concept. Verse 37, now that the dead are raised, oh, they, even Moses showed at the bush. You remember when Moses was at the bush, he called the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, in that passage in Exodus chapter 3, in that passage in Exodus chapter 3, it's not Moses talking. He wrote it down. But it is God speaking to Moses that says this. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It wasn't Moses said this. Moses wrote it down for him, but he just writing down what God said. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he's not just saying, yeah, the God of your ancestors, they knew about me too. Look what Jesus says this means. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. We're in this world. We know people while they live, and when we don't know them anymore after they die, or after we die, we don't know them anymore. In this world, we're just only in this world. 
But God is not in this world. He's in that world and the resurrection. And all live, all live to Him. I put a note here. I don't usually bring up commentaries, but I put a note in my notes that says that Adam Clark's note here is interesting. (coughs) And it was this one down here about halfway down I wanted to read to you. Adam Clark is a commentator on the Bible. One not less remarkable in the Shemoth Rabbah, Folio 159. It's a Jewish commentary on the teachings of the rabbis. And this is, Rabbi Abin saith, the Lord said unto Moses, find me ten righteous persons among the people, and I will not destroy thy people. And said Moses, behold, here am I, Aaron, Eleazar, Ithamar, Phinehas, Caleb, and Joshua. But God said, that's seven. What about three more? And when Moses knew not what to do, he said, O eternal God, do those live that are dead? Yes, saith God. Then said Moses, if those that are dead do live, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He answered God's query about ten righteous people using Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the resurrection of the dead and the immortality and immateriality of the soul were not strange or unknown doctrines among the Jews. And I just thought that was worth sharing. Sometimes if you ask a Jewish person about heaven or eternal life, they say, we don't believe that. And it's a little harder to show much about it in the Old Testament. But the rabbis taught it down through the centuries. He's not a God of the dead, but of the living. All live unto him. Now the Sadducees had asked him the question. The scribes and the Pharisees, they're still there. This is not the Sadducees that answered him again. This is some of the, those Pharisees, the scribes answering, said, hey, Good answer. (laughs) You put those Sadducees in their place. Master, thou hast well said. And after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. It occurred to me this morning while we were getting ready for the service that sometimes we get all tickled by how Jesus stopped that mouth and turned that question back on him and think, I wish I could answer like he answers. He had an advantage on us. And it wasn't just he knew everything. His advantage was that his motive was perfect. His heart was broken for these Jewish leaders. He wept over Jerusalem. He desperately, desperately wanted them, not for his own sake, but wanted them to recognize who he was and accept himself and the kingdom and after the crucifixion, just go on into the kingdom with him. He wanted them to believe he not that he knew they he didn't he did know that they wouldn't but his heart was right and sometimes when we're challenged with hard questions a jehovah's witness at the door or something we want to play gotcha with him that's not what jesus did and in conversation with anybody that's not saved where's your heart Don't try to win the conversation. Don't try to win the argument. What would Jesus do? Now that's overused, I know, but it's more important first to know what did Jesus do than what would Jesus do. But once somebody knows what Jesus did, then we should behave the way Jesus would have behaved in our place. I hope that makes some sense. Be a good listener. Well, Jesus didn't get any more questions asked of him, but he says, I'll take a moment here, I'll ask you a question. It's a method of teaching, isn't it? And he said unto them, the crowd is gathered around, but he's going to ask a question of the teachers, like he did when he was 12 years old. He said unto them, how say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Yes, he did say that in the book of Psalms. Psalm 110, verse 1, a psalm of David. 
the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, said unto my Lord, my Adonai, my master, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Widely recognized by the Jewish leaders that my Lord, my Adonai, is the Messiah. And David wrote this, as, as Jesus said, David said it, the Lord Jehovah the God of Israel said to my Lord, the Messiah, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He was indeed the son of David, the promised son of David. That was how they recognized the Messiah, the ones that were wanting to be healed by him. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. It's a title of the Messiah. But David called him his Lord. And Jesus said, so how's, how is he David's son if he's David's Lord? The verses in Psalm 110 are powerful. Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. When's that? That's after the cross, right? That's after Jesus goes back to heaven. And the Father says, Son, sit right here. We'll get it straightened around on earth and you'll, your enemies will be under your feet and you can go rule and reign. In verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He'll judge among the heathen. He'll fill the places with dead bodies who wound the heads over many countries. This is a messianic psalm about the, the time that the Father sends the Son back to earth and rule after he has waited till the appropriate time. And back in Luke, Jesus says, how is he David's son? David called him Lord. How is he then his son? And they said, I don't know. I, they were confused. But he's David's son because he's the recipient of the promise given to David of a king to rule over his house forever. The son of David, the royal line, came all the way down through Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, which is called the Christ. David called him Lord. Uh, let's finish up with just a few thoughts here again in Acts chapter 13. Still written by Luke, recording what Paul has done here with Barnabas. This chapter begins with them telling the story in a town They'd gone to Perga, then they came to Antioch and Pisidia. That's not the Antioch in Syria where they were sent out from. And they went down into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And you wouldn't know this unless you'd been taught, but when a person in the synagogue sat down, he was taking the posture of a teacher. We got this all backwards. You should be standing, I should be sitting in something comfortable. That's the way they did it in the synagogue. When they sat down, they were offering as visiting scholars to teach after the reading of the law and the prophets. So the rulers of the synagogue said unto them, Well, men and brethren, if you have a word of encouragement for us, of exhortation for the people, say on. And Paul stood up, and you see, he started right out with a wallet illustration. He says, Men of Israel, you that fear God, give audience. Let this hand represent you and me in this. I don't know. It says he gestured, beckoned with his hand. I wouldn't doubt he used illustrations like we do. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land. They loved to tell their story. They loved to hear the story of Egypt. And, oh, they were 40 years in the wilderness, and then they destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan and divided the land to them, gave them judges for 450 years till Samuel, and then they wanted a king, and he gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a uh, man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. Then he removed him and raised up David to be their king. And he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. 
of this man's seed, David, has God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. He says, now when John, that's John the Baptist, first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, as John fulfilled his course, he said, who do you think I am, John the Baptist? I'm not him. I'm not him. There's one coming after me whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and you guys out there too, whomever, whoever among you fears God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Those fellows over at Jerusalem and their rulers didn't know who he was. They didn't get the voices of the prophets, which they read them every Sabbath day. They fulfilled, fulfilled the prophets by condemning him. They found no cause of death in him, but they desired Pilate to, that he be slain when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from a tree, laid him in a sepulcher, put him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, the gospel, the promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. And he raised up Jesus again. As it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And it's concerning that he raised him up from the dead. Now no more to return to corruption. He saith on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. And he saith in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer the Holy One to see corruption. Paul used three different psalms in, in two breaths. David, after he'd served his own generation, by the will of God, fell on sleep, laid to his father, saw no corruption. He whom God raised again saw no corruption, and that leads us to these marvelous verses of forgiveness of sins. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. By him all that join the church give 10%. And no, no, he didn't say that. By him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses, and then he warns them, Beware, lest that come upon you spoken of in the prophets. Behold, you despisers, and wonder, and perish. I work a work in your days which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Be careful of your response to the first time you hear the gospel. Warn people. By him all that believe are justified from all things. They're given through him the forgiveness of sins, the promise of a home in heaven, the gift of his righteousness and everlasting life. Justified means at the court, at the judge's stand of God, they are declared righteous, not in their own rags, but covered up at the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. Justified, justified. It's a wonderful thing. And all that believe are justified. And that is the end of the message, other than the warning. Don't hear this and turn away. And many did believe. And I hope many will continue to believe as they understand this message from the Word. So that's as far as we'll go today in Luke's Gospel. We're not quite done with chapter 20. That's not Luke's Gospel. Sorry, click. That's Luke's Gospel. From, from verse 19 down through the answer to the Sadducees and who Jesus is. And then he's going to warn the crowd about the scribes and the Pharisees. We should pray and thank the Lord for his word. Father in heaven, as we've met this morning, this rich, rich passage teaching us how Jesus taught and answered these puzzling questions put to him to catch him in his words. We can learn much both from his real answers that he gave and from the way he answered the questions of the opponents. Help us to learn to be winsome, to love those that oppose us, to do good to those that oppose themselves and as Paul said, count yourselves unworthy unworthy of everlasting life. 
Help us to reach out to them anyway. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless. We are dismissed. And you can go to the restroom and get a drink of water, but we'll have church here in just a few minutes.